it's worth noting that the free speech framework and the 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 language of free speech and where a lot of the uh, activism side of it comes from is the 60s it is the myth of the 60s and the myths of history a free speech discourse is is also based upon this laughable idea of the marketplace of ideas <laughs> <laughs> uh, where ideas are evaluated by homo uh, reditus, as I put it. Um, to, to read a, a quick excerpt here from the Stop Demanding Free Speech article over there in the uh, Antipathy Substack, uh, do go visit. Um, As outside political causes were given free reign to influence campus activities, the all-encompassing student activist experience um, that higher education is sold as now formed over the preceding decades or the following decades. So the first point to note about free speech and the language of free speech is it is a holdover from... Oh, sorry, the, the activist days of the 1960s. It very much fits in the framework of the civil rights era. It's a large part of the myth of that era, the myth of the 60s, that there was this stodgy old 1950s regime that wouldn't let the poor students speak. It wouldn't let people say what they wanted, and people protested on campus for civil rights and free speech, and then the world became better. <laughs> it's just, and it's, it's just pure nonsense. I, I, I don't think anybody here really buys into the myths of history as written. I know our members certainly don't. Uh, a quick segue there. Thank you, Anthony Keane, and thank you, John Morton. I see you there in the chat. And there's a couple more members who sometimes lurk as well. So we are still fully monetized somehow. So if you do want to support the channel via YouTube, um, please do. But it, 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 this is something we've gone over before. We don't want to repeat ourselves too much with this. But I think one of the best worked examples oh, don't in all of this, really, is the... Uh, oops, sorry, there was probably a bit of uh, audio over there. But... Uh, one of the best examples I think we have uh, in the moment is the fact that we've had a uh, a blossoming of speech, let's say, around about immigration. We have the small boats discourse. We have um, the framework of what we refer to as, I uh, hear it is, as performative failure. A lot of stuff has happened this week in terms of UK politics. I know a lot of people were kind of hoping we'd talk about this, but we did talk about this already. Um, you can talk about what you want, you can have what you want, you can have the conversations you want, you can even have people come out and positively support some of the causes that you want, but it doesn't matter unless something comes of the speech. It's a very, very simple example, but it would be would have been unheard of three, four years ago to have a, say, a conservative politician talking about the fact that migrants are full of hotels that uh, migrants full of hotels hotels are full of migrants migrants full of hotels migrants the size of talbot no um but the hotels are full of migrants that was consigned to the the dustbin of conspiracy theories in many people's minds but really we have here we have this week just 19 hours ago robert uh generic resigns as immig uh, immigration minister over rwanda legislation um, and we have talk of the migrant hotels. Here he is again, back in October. Uh, the migrant hotels will close. Rishi Sunak is currently beating his chest about immigration in a way that people are slightly baffled by because there's so much talk of immigration, but there's not really any action on immigration. And as we get into this discussion a bit more, it is worth noting that you can have a very, very open and honest dialogue about immigration and still have all of the implementation paralyzed. The biggest problem with demanding free speech is that all you're doing is talking. And we'll be reiterating that in certain ways and hammering that point home as we move forward. But anyway, to get back to the point of the myths of history, it really is kind of a, a tainted way of, of trying to appeal to, to the regime. It's trying to use their language against them, but this is their language. The civil rights activists were the good guys in the 60s, will be just like them, is the mindset, the really boomerish mindset you see. 
when you get to people trying to do this this right wing free speech um, kind of thing. And and to be fair, people at the LA Times here, and here's an article, an archive of the Washington Post, be going over as well. Um, they're right. They're right, really, that these these second hand activist pants do not fit the political right. They're not something that that naturally works with them. And really what they're doing is they're adopting the mindset of the leftists of yesteryear. Here's the headline. Berkeley gave birth to the free speech movement in the 1960s. Now conservatives are demanding it include them. Uh, here's a little picture there. And that, that's where the thumbnail comes from as well. It comes from the Berkeley protests, which allowed all of this space to develop all of this space to develop where people were talking about leftist causes rather than the core of their academic subjects. That really was the thrust of the free speech movement in the 1960s. And it was done quite cynically, as we'll get onto, but I'll just read a smidge of this. University of California at Berkeley has spent the week entangled in a controversy after it cancelled the speech by conservative provocateur Ann Coulter. Man, she's gone away. Remember Ann Coulter? <laughs> then reverse course Thursday and announced it would allow her to talk on campus early next month. The decision to prohibit the speaker at any public university would have triggered criticism, but at Berkeley, a symbol of campus free speech in America, it meant much more. Again, they are they are playing into the accoutrements and the myths here. They're going, well, it's Berkeley. Berkeley's a bastion of free speech. What about the 60s? And really, all that does is surrender to the myths of the 60s. All that does is surrender in the same way that Ronald Reagan did in the 1980s by making MLK Day a federal holiday. It surrenders the right completely to the 60s left. It means that you really are just a 60s leftist claiming that the Democrats are the real racists. And as we go through this, there'll be a, uh, a couple of memes here that I'll be getting up. But there's, uh, there's one I've made here. <laughs> there's, there's a couple here. This, is, uh, this really is the essence for me. It is, it is the marketplace of ideas. We'll be bringing the, the various marketplaces of ideas up as we go along. But, but the, 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 the appeal to free speech is also an appeal to the marketplace of ideas. It is an appeal to this mythical sense that there is a conversation to be had. That if we can all have open and free debate, that meritocracy, merit, that merits will, uh, will reassert itself, that we will have all the merit in the world. And really, all you end up with is, as I said, homo reditus. You end up as man as redditor. Uh, which we'll uh, there's, there's a little quote at the end of this stream from uh, from the last part of the last of the articles that uh, are on the anti-politics substack, which I think really really sums that up. But here here we go. We have two competing ideas of the marketplace of ideas. We have uh, the quote unquote right wing marketplace of ideas with all the acceptable ideas of James Lindsay and the anti woke crowd and Turning Point UK waving their Israeli flag, because well as we all know. We do indeed love the nation of Israel. And uh, we don't say our affirmation these days. Uh, we let Nigel say it for us. Uh, take it away, Nigel, before we get demonetized for, uh, for not praising. You may think it's complicated, but be clear. A sovereign state of Israel has been attacked. War has broken out. 